Good morning, Living Grace. Good morning, Chris. Huh. You know, Sunday mornings and Saturday nights are the enemy's favorite days, you know. They try to keep you from, he tries to keep you from getting to church. But for all of you who got here, the victory has already been won. Let's p sing praises to our God. And there's nothing that the devil hates worse than us worshiping. So there you go. Let's raise and praise our, raise our hands and praise our God. Now I'm going to sing in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder, you're going to hear my praises roar. Up from the ashes, hope will arise. Death is defeated, our king is alive. the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah my weapon is a melody. I raise a Yeah. 
God says, trust me and don't be afraid. I am your strength and your song. He spoke the universe into existence and his, his power is absolutely unlimited. Our human weakness, when we give it to him, is like a magnet drawing us into his power. He, he wants us to give us, give him our burdens because his yoke is light and fear and anxiety and all the junk going on in the world and there seems to be just more sickness and, and pain and just suffering and people are isolated and lonely and that is not from God. God wants to be there with you and for you through every waking moment of the day. To trust in God means to give him everything, to put your faith and the word commit means that certain decisions are made in advance. So we're coming here, we're committing to God, we're making this decision in advance, introspective of the circumstances. So no matter what's going around, I just pray that our hearts would be softened and just drawn closer to God through our commitment because I fail every single solitary day. And I spend too much time doing things that I shouldn't be or, you know, just not when I could be reading my Bible or spending time with God, I want to obey, I want to devote, and I want to dedicate myself and just, he holds our hands, or he holds us in the palm of his hand. Anger, fear, anxiety, sadness, bitterness, they don't win. God is our conqueror and our victor. And I just, uh, I just pray that we would just hear his voice and commit to him even more our faith, Lord. Oh, you are God and we are not. And we need to be reminded of that. I'm sure. I know I do on a regular basis.
giver of life. May your spirit just breathe on each and every person here. Lord, we want more of you. Increase our faith, increase our commitment to help us to, to learn how to do better. You meet us exactly where we are, and you know exactly what we need. And we commit this day our thoughts, our hearts. Love the Lord with all your God. Your, your, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Lord, I commit to do that today with all everything that is in me. Even though I will fall and stumble, probably the minute I walk out the door, but Lord, you are more than enough and you will give me all that I need. And I just, we thank you. Thank you for who you are and what you've done. It's 
not what we did, but what you have done for us. Draw us close, increase our commitment, change our hearts. We thank you for this day. And we thank you in the mighty name of Jesus. And everyone said... Hello, hello. Good morning, everybody. Good to see you all this morning. Thank you so much for coming back. We've been talking about our capital campaign kickoff, and we were hoping we didn't scare you all away. So I'm happy to see the whole family here today. It's a blessing, a blessing. First of all, I just want to thank you guys. You guys are the best family, church family ever. And I just want to thank you guys for all the prayers that you've given and support to our family. My, those that don't know, my father had been in the hospital. My sister's in the hospital. My mom's had been at home, but with a lot of pain. And um, my dad is out of the hospital. He still has some specialists to see, so please continue to pray for him. My sister hopefully will be out of the hospital this week. She had COVID. My dad had some other heart issues going on. So thank you, thank you, your support, your prayers, it's been such a blessing to us, and so you guys are the best, thank you so much. With that, we have some announcements, besides our men's retreat coming up at the end of April, <clears throat> which you just saw, we have something for everyone for the next month <laughs> to keep you connected. Next week, next Saturday, the 27th at 5 p.m., we'll be having our Passover Seder right here in the sanctuary. It is going to cost you two whole dollars, and if you don't have it, Pastor Richie will be happy to pay for that for you. <laughs> two whole dollars, the cheapest meal you will have all year, and you can sign up for that at that blue table right over there with Miss Sandy. Um, so we do need you to register so we know how much food. There will be a meal included. We will be going through all the fun, tasty Passover elements and uh, just hearing about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and how he was proclaimed in the Passover as he was from the beginning. That's going to be an amazing time, so don't miss it. We want to do that as a family, and that's going to be a blessing. The following weekend is 
as you all know, is Resurrection Sunday. We will be having three services, 6 a.m., and then our regular services at 8.30 and 10.30. But those of you that like the sunrise service, it'll be right out here in the parking lot um, at sunrise, starting at 6 a.m., before sunrise, actually. Um, the April the 8th, we're starting a new inductive Bible study. For those of you that are not part of a Bible study or would just like to get more in-depth in a Bible study, this is very in-depth. And like I said last week, they just finished John and spent a year and a half. They do like a half a lesson a week because they want to just absorb and get everything. And I'll tell you what, everybody who started at the beginning, except for two that for some re other reasons couldn't make it, everybody had finished the whole course. That's just how good and how, um, and we got several of them in here, I see. Um, it is on Zoom. Uh, so from the comfort of your own home, you can join into that. There are videos and stuff. So anyway, the sign up, you can sign up with Miss Linda over there with the yellow folder. And I don't think it's online yet, but if you go to our light groups, it is the inductive study group with my parents, Wayne and Shirley Shelley, and they said, Let, make sure everybody knows it doesn't matter what's going on at our house. Don't worry about that. We're still going to have the Bible study. So they're, they are overly committed <laughs> to that. <laughs> no, they love it. So um, that begins April the 8th. April the 11th, which is the following Sunday, we are going to have a new members class. I know some of you have been asking for that for a while. We haven't had one for a while. So April the 11th, mark it on your calendar. After service here on Sunday, we will have a new member class, those of you that are interested in becoming members of the church. Uh, are welcome to come, and you will learn all about the ins and outs of Foursquare, uh, the visions of Living Grace uh, specifically, and you will have the opportunity to become a official member, which means you can vote and um, I don't know, what else can you do? <laughs> Call yourself an official member, I guess. <laughs> um, but, it, but you can learn about our church and the Foursquare Church. So even if you're not sure if this is where you want to make your home, come out and you can hear all about it and make your decision then. Sound good? All right. Awesome. <clears throat> The following weekend, we're not trying to keep you busy, but, you know, pray about it. Pick and choose. The following weekend is the Women's Essential Conference that's going to be held at Cornerstone Christian Church. You can sign up online at EssentialConference.com, and there is a cost, but if you sign up before March 31st, you will get a discount. It, that's if you want to go in person. You can also do it online. They're doing it. I don't know if it's Facebook Live or Zoom or whatever. You'll, you can find out when you go to their website, essentialconference.com. That's also on our website. The link is on our website. Um, and so I don't know if there's a small fee for that or if it's free. I should have checked that before I did announce. 19 Thank you, Linda. $19 to, to do the online one. Um, so, and then also just a reminder, Paulette put a lot of work into encouraging the women. That's just on her heart to love and encourage the women at Living Grace. So she put a video together. Every month is going to be someone else encouraging the women. Check it out. The month of March is Paulette, and that's under Women's Ministry on our website as well. And then lastly, um, if you are giving, just a quick note from our count team, if you're giving your tithes and offerings by a check, could you please write it out, the whole thing, sorry, Living Grace Foursquare Church, no abbreviations, because otherwise they have to take the time to turn your check over and write the name and stuff on the back. So just a little helpful thing for them. If you would remember to do that, we would appreciate it. With that, Pastor Ricci. It's, it's a special thing when your wife calls you Pastor Richie. <laughs> oh. When she calls me Richard, I might have to just leave and catch y'all next week. <laughs> we'll see you later. <laughs> um, 
we have a family member here uh, who is, um, <clears throat> understands the times and is doing great exploits. And so, Joshua, would you come up and just kind of give a little quick update about what, uh, <clears throat> what you and your tribe are up to? Many of you know him. Um, this is on Facebook Live, so we have to be careful how we explain things. So you have to read between the lines, if you know what I mean. Anyway, go ahead, brother. We're still here. <laughs> <laughs> stuck with a purpose, but stuck nonetheless. <laughs> stuck with, that's a good message to uh, tell you. So, um, yeah, it's been now a little over a year since I, I was here. Um, that sounds weird even to me because... This has been like the first year in 15 years of ministry that I have not been on a plane. <laughs> I have literally been stuck in Alabama uh, doing teaching and conferences via Zoom. God bless technology, but man, it's nice to see people in a room, right? Um, so <clears throat> this was my first flight in a year. I almost forgot how to do it. Um, <clears throat> but uh, our family's doing well. Uh, we are still here, obviously. We're waiting for our host nation to update their uh, travel and po COVID policies. Uh, we're hoping to hear from them April 1st to see what direction they're going to go. If that's going to go in a positive direction, then that'll set this, the wheels in motion for us to start, uh, you know, the fire sale of everything we own, our house and vehicles and everything, and start to pin down a date to get moved over there. Um, that's not a guarantee, however, so we're, we have to wait and, and see what's going to happen. Um, but we have, while we have been stuck here stateside, um, it has been uh, clearly, um, you know, I, I don't know if I can say God caused it, but God has certainly redeemed that time that, that we've been here, um, and we've been having lots of good meetings, and God, just seeing God put different pieces of the puzzle into place, I now have a full business plan. We're shopping that around uh, to potential uh, donors and uh, putting lots of different pieces in place um, and personnel. God has been really faithful in bringing key individuals uh, to potentially be part of our team. So uh, we're really looking forward to moving to that country, which I cannot say from stage, but um, the 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 uh, adventure tourism plan, you know, as crazy as that sounds, you know, I've I've been questioning God's wisdom in a lot of different areas of life right now. Um, you know, my God calling me to start an adventure tourism business in the middle of a pandemic, um, but uh, like things are actually moving forward, and I'm we're getting more and more excited to see what God is going to do, and of course how He's going to do it. Because um, when it happens, you know, I will be able to take none of the credit. <laughs> it will be God and God alone. Um, but we're looking forward to, to, to moving. Still don't know exactly when that's going to be, so we appreciate your, your prayers. And if you want more information, uh, I can give you, you know, more sensitive information um, personally. But thank you guys for your continued support and prayers. We love you. <clears throat> Amen. Before you go. Let's all stand up. We just want to pray. And um, uh, Brother Josh will be sharing uh, Wednesday night live from the living room. We're not sure exactly where the living room will be Wednesday, but um, <clears throat> he's going to be sharing. And it's pretty sensitive stuff uh, that we can share online. So um, <clears throat> even in your mentioning of it, just, you know, keep it on the DL. Okay. And if you don't know what that means, look to someone else who's younger than you and they'll probably tell you what it is, okay? So Father, just thank you for the opportunity to uh, link arms and to participate, knowing, Lord, that uh, <clears throat> your purposes and your plans are, are uh, beyond our uh, understanding sometimes, but they're good. And uh, we pray for, as they transition, we pray for uh, uh, grace in moving and selling and uh, all of the, the logistics that go along with that um, and this final stretch of preparation uh, before that time comes. So thank you for divine appointments and thank you for those that will uh, be involved in this that even uh, Josh and Stacy aren't aware of right now. 
uh, we pray that hedge of protection about them and their and their children in um, all things in this season in Jesus name amen amen <laughs> yay applause applause you can uh, speak to this gentleman later and get a little more detail uh, um, he he and his family are are profoundly pursuing the heart of the Father for the purposes and plans that he has called them to. And it is exciting to partner with you and your family and the Lord with what he's doing. It is thrilling to just know that we can serve you guys. Um. <clears throat> I know, right? Like that, you, you, that happens and everyone looks at you. And you're like, pressure, where's that button? Faithfulness. Faithfulness. Thinking about that, that word um, recently, it says in 1 Kings 8, 56, not one word of God has failed of all the good promises he gave. Not one word of God has failed of all the good promises He gave. Faithfulness. Our God is faithful. It is so hard to grab a hold of things that we can believe in, that are true, that are right, that we know will be faithful. God is, is eternally reliable. He is steadfast. He is unwavering. If God says he will do it, he will do it 100% of the time. He is faithful, past, present, and future. He's a covenant-keeping God. We can always, even when we cannot grasp hold of the next step, we can trust that he has the next step. And in the midst of our darkest moments, we have faith. And we can believe that he is there with us because he said he would be and he is always faithful to his word. One time in all of eternity that God is not true to his word, then he's not God. He is 100% faithful. And that is a necessary thing in the season that we live in right now. Can you say amen to that? I believe it is. We're in the book of Judges. It's been 40 years of peace under the judge Othniel. What we talked about last week is that Israel is in this cycle of, of sin that leads to slavery, that leads to supplication or them crying out to God, which God sends a deliverer that brings salvation, and there's a season of serenity, and we'll see this cycle over and over again. Well, it's been 40 years of peace under the judge Othniel. He dies, and Israel cycles from this, this season of peace and serenity uh, to this place of sin. It says in chapter 3, verse 12, And the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord strengthened Eglon, king of Moab, against Israel because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. We always want to grasp something about the character and nature of God when we study His Word. Before we might even get to how that applies to us, what's it telling us about God? And on display here is the sovereignty of God. And, and this is something that we talk about over again, but it continues to sort of blow my mind that God is so sovereign. And I was, as we were praying before service, he, 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 God knows all things and is sovereign over all things to the nth degree, uh, to, to beyond the minutest uh, ability. His sovereignty is always in place. And here we see an example of that where, where the Lord strengthens the enemy of his, peop of his people and he resolves the ability or, or he uh, 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 weakens the resolve of his people. Get this, because of the cycle that they're in, God strengthens the enemy of his people and he, and he causes the resolve 
of his own people to be weakened because he is sovereign. He raises up one. He takes another down. He's in control of everything that happens in every dimension that we know and that we don't know of. And he raises up a king and he takes a king down. He raises an administration. He lowers it. God is sovereign and we can believe that no matter what he has allowed to happen, what he has happened, and even in this instance, that, that God himself strengthens the enemy and he weakens the resolve of his people. And it's mind-boggling to me. But that's the sovereignty of our God. And remember, he always has purpose. So there's a reason that he allows his people to go into slavery, which they're about to go into. It says in, uh, well, serenity, uh, back to sin, the people have 40 years of peace. 40 years, that's a long time. 40 years of peace. Peace was not a given to these people. It wasn't their right. Like we should live in peace just because we're the people of God. Yes and no. Because the peace that they would have in their land was conditional, wasn't it? There are some promises of God that are unconditional. And there are some that are conditional. Here's the promise. The promise is if you continue to follow my ways, if you don't worship idols and all of these crazy belief systems in, and worldviews in the land that I'm sending you into, if you continue to stick with me and follow me, you will have peace in your land. But if you don't, you will end up in bondage. And so peace was not a given because they had to maintain it. And I thought about this, peace is not a given in my life either. I must maintain it. Oh, peace comes from the Lord. But Philippians 4.9 tells me to be anxious of some things. Nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, specific request, and thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And then after I have been anxious of nothing, I have anxious thought, anxiety comes over me, it, 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 it starts to grip my mind and my, my soul, and I have to make a decision and say, no, I will not be anxious. And it's not because, you know, I'm so uh, full of confidence and I know I can over... No, I will not be anxious. I will not allow that thought to wreak havoc in my mind. But I'm going to turn and pray about that. And I'm going to transfer the burden of this off of me and on to God. Everything by prayer and supplication uh, with thanksgiving because it's, it's, it's not logical to be thankful for things that haven't changed yet. But faith is able to do that. With thanksgiving to let my request be made known to God, then the peace of God. Oh, oh, the pe oh, what people, what lengths people will go to in our world to have peace. But more so, the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. I don't get it, but I have it because I'm not allowing this thing to take control of my life and my mind and my heart. Oh, the peace of God that surpasses all understanding guards my what? My heart. My heart. Oh, folks, guard your heart. Guard your heart above all else because out of it flow the wells, the springs of life. Everything flows out of the heart. And the, the Lord says, guard your heart. But I, 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 I'm praying, I'm thanking, thanking God. And the peace of God that surpasses all understanding guards my heart and my mind my heart and my mind in Christ Jesus. See, just because I'm a Christian doesn't mean that peace, I automatically have peace. Oh, I'm just going to have peace. No, I have to maintain that peace. And I maintain that, my, that peace by, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving and not allowing the, the worries and the cares of the day to weigh me down because they will. It's a burden that's too heavy for me to carry in my own strength. And the strongest man or the strongest woman we brought to their knees in our life today 
because of the burdens that we have around us. So I keep giving it away, and that's a conscious decision, and then I have peace. Perhaps these folks thought that God would not be true to His Word, that if they worshiped idols, He would bring them to slavery. Perhaps that's what they thought. Once the judge dies, they return to their old ways of sin. It's almost like it, they're depending on the judge to maintain things. Oh, oh! as, as long as Othniel is here, we're good. And, and, and Othniel is a strong leader, and, and, and he has a relationship with, with God. Like, like the man one time we're, we're talking about spiritual things and talking about heaven. Oh, he guaranteed me he was going to heaven. And I go, you are very confident in that. What's the basis for that? He goes, because you know what, man? I know my priest is praying for me. As long as he's praying for me, I'm good. I went, oh, no. Okay. You're going to get in by proxy. Someone else is going to pray you in. That's not how it works. It seems that these people were depending on the judge to maintain their spirituality rather than doing the daily hard work of humbling themselves and depending on the Lord. We thank God for our position. I thank God for who I am in Christ Jesus. I thank God that my name is written in his book in heaven and all of the, all of the things that go along with that that we could spend the next five years talking about. I'm thankful for that. And at the same time, I have to strive for holiness and I have to rely on God and no one else can do that for me. I, I have to choose to fight the, the, the wars that go on in my mind and my heart. I have to choose to rely on God. I have to, to choose to crucify the flesh daily. No one else can do that for me. I can't depend on someone else's spirituality to cause me to be a, a greater follower of Christ. Oh, they're great teachers and they're great preachers and they're great uh, brothers and sisters in Christ that encourage you, but I cannot depend on them for my spiritual growth. I must get it from God myself. And if I, complete, if I depend on others to grow me spiritually rather than going to the source, then I'm creating a bit of an idol and I, I will find myself weak because I have not gone straight to God myself. We must do that. Paul wrote in Galatians 5.24, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Oh, wouldn't it be great if we become a follower of Jesus and those sinful things are all gone? We could be like, yeah, man, haven't struggled with that in years, bro. Woo! Oh, you still struggling? <laughs> no. It's a battle. But no one else can fight that battle for you. It's clear that crucifying the flesh is not something done to the believer, but it's done by the believer. That's my battle. I can't depend on others. Whatever the cause, they go back to their old ways. I'm familiar with that. My first service was too. You guys are not so much. Go back to our own ways. God brings them back to slavery. It says in verse 13, Then he gathered to himself, this king, a people of Ammon and Amalek, went and defeated Israel, and took possession of the city of Palms. So the children of Israel served Eglon, king of Moab, 18 years of bondage and slavery. 18 years. Oh, oh that, that, that so exacerbates and drains someone. The, in the, the bondage of, of slavery. They were free, and they were passionate about God. And then they turned and went back to their evil ways, and their whole society plunged into, into, into subjugation and slavery. God said he would do that. And it took 18 years. And then they began to cry out. Supplication. 
They cried out, it says in verse 15, but when the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for them, Ehud, the son of Gera, the Benjamite, a left-handed man. They cry out. I know what you're thinking. Like, man, what took them so long? That's not the question. The question is, what takes me so long? To cry out and humble myself and say, okay, God, you got this, I don't. Okay, God, I need you in this. Okay, I'm tired of trying to do it myself. I'm tired of running into this thing again and again and again. God, help me. God, I surrender. Justice is getting what you deserve. Justice. What did Israel deserve? Israel deserved for God to say, you know what? I'm done with you. This sin, slavery, cycle, I've had enough of it. They deserve to be cut off. Don't you want justice in your life too? You know God is a just God, but the justice that He mediates is different than what our definition of justice is in the world. I mean, maybe we can have some semblance of justice if there's a judicial system that's, for the most part, works, which it doesn't always. It's not perfect. But there are those who want justice in our society, but they don't want God. Which begs the question, what is justice if there isn't one who is just who tells me what that is? Social justice, though there might be aspects of it that are correct, has built into it the fact or the belief that you owe me something. You owe me this. And I have rights, therefore I demand this. And here's the reality, the biblical definition of justice is that justice is getting what you deserve. And what I deserve is to be separated from God and hell for all eternity. That's what I deserve because I'm a sinner who has committed cosmic treason against a holy God and I know it. Someone has said that justice means just as if I've never sinned. That's so wrong. That's not what justice means. Justice means I'm guilty and I know it. And I deserve nothing. And it takes a person to be humble, to recognize, and God to open up their eyes to understand that I have nothing to offer God. And I'm sinful and wretched. And that I don't want his justice because his justice on a cosmic scale would send me to hell for all eternity. But what I want is his mercy. That's the act of not administering justice when that justice is punitive. Because of my sinfulness, I deserve death and eternal separation from God. Romans 6.23 tells me in Isaiah 59.2, but God provided an atonement for sin, and through it, he shows me mercy. And I say, God, don't give me what I deserve. You ever heard someone say, oh, man, I'll tell you what, when I get to heaven, oh, I want to have a conversation with God. No, you don't. First of all, there are no conversations with God. You have transposed an earthly judicial system with the King of kings and the Lord of lords who knows all things, who knows your motives, who knows why you say what you say, who knows every idle word that you've ever spoken, every time you've thought about breaking the law, every time you've broken the law, the Ten Commandments, and even if you didn't do it, you thought about it, you'll be guilty of all of that. You cannot, there's no court of appeals. You cannot say, well, my defense attorney is not here. Can we read a post? postpone this for two weeks. No, there's no discussion in heaven because he's a just God. And one day there are people who unfortunately want nothing to do with God. And because he's a just God, he will give them what they desire. And they will go to a place where there is no God. That's just. I want mercy.
God doesn't deliver the Christian to the natural consequence of his sin, which is damnation. But I receive his mercy and I receive his grace. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. M mercy is getting what, uh, justice is getting what you deserve. And grace is getting what you don't deserve. Uh, that's, 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 that's good. Thank you, Jesus. Back to Ehud. Ehud's a lefty. In his time, that was considered a handicap. They often forced people to use their right hand no matter what, even if they were left-handed. So Ehud's got to go pay tribute to the king of Moab. He's not happy about it. Did we mention that God raised up a deliverer and that he's the man? So he goes to pay this tribute, and it was probably a large delegation of people, and, and he straps a dagger on his left thigh, which is unorthodox because he's a lefty. Normally they would strap it on the other side. So you wouldn't expect a weapon to be used in that capacity. Well, he has this conversation with the, with the, with the king. He gives him the tribute. He leaves, and then he comes back and says, I've got a message from God for you. And the king says, really? Everybody out, everybody out. Come, come into, the, into the inner chamber here and, and, and tell me what it is. And he takes the dagger and he assassinates the king. One commentator, Wolf, said this about that. Some are troubled by this act of assassination. We cannot say that this event is a general approval or a commission of those who would assassinate rulers who oppress the people of God. Like someone who assassinates an abortion doctor, believing that that's justice and bringing about the righteousness of God. It is not. It is significant that this was never suggested or even an issue in the early Christian persecutions. Now, the zealots, they wanted to overthrow Rome. That did not work out for them. God did not necessarily approve of the method used by Ehud. It may be significant that the Spirit of the Lord did not come on him, uh, on, Eph, on Ehud, uh, and that he was never described as judging Israel. Whatever the case, this is what happened and God allowed this to happen because God raised up this judge. But it's not a license to believe that by our anger or by our own system of justice, we can bring about the righteousness of God. Verse 26 says, while the servants were waiting, Ehud escaped after he assassinated the king, passing the stone idols on his way to uh, Sariah, when he arrived in the hill country of Ephraim, he had sounded a call to arms, and he led a band of Israelites down the hills. Verse 28, follow me, he said, for the Lord has given you victory over Moab, your enemy. So they followed him. In verse 29, they attacked the Moabites and killed about 10,000 of their strongest and most able-bodied warriors. Not one of them escaped. So Moab was conquered by Israel that day, and there was peace in the land for 80 years. Here's the key. The Lord raised up a deliverer for them. They cried out to God. They humbled themselves. They said, God, we can't do this on our own. Lord, we're tired of being in bondage. We're tired of, of being subjugated by, by these people that you have empowered, and they maybe didn't even know that. And they humble. That's the answer to any nation. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any land. Righteousness comes about when the people of God humble themselves in brokenness and humility and say, God, move in our nation. Lord, don't make us a Christian nation. Just bring people in our lives that we can encounter with and we can tell the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
Father, we can't do this on our own. We need you. Lord, we need you in our individual lives. But Lord, let your kingdom grow. Let your kingdom expand and use me. God's not trying to make America a Christian nation. He's winning hearts and souls of people, which is much deeper than that. He's not interested in the geography. He's interested in people. And he's interested in his people being salt and being light and bringing people to the kingdom. Oh, that's what brings change. The Lord raises up. May, Lord, may you raise up deliverers in Las Vegas. May you raise up people who will go and who will preach the good news of the gospel. Let's not wait for someone else to do it. Someone who's more gifted or whatever. No, let's do it as the Lord raises us up. I wrote this down also, never underestimate the difference one person can make. What changed? These soldiers are the same men who were in bondage for 18 years. Suddenly God moves on the heart of one man and he stands up and the entire nation gets energized and they go from being slaves to being soldiers to having victory because God raised up a man and God empowered them and once again the sovereignty of God as he has empowered the enemies of God, he begins to subjugate them and he raises up his people to step into the promises and the things that he said that he would do for them when they humble themselves before him because they're his people and he's committed to them in spite of themselves. Can you say amen to that? I look in the mirror and say, okay, Lord, you, 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 hey, you pick me, <laughs> you know, you're, you're stuck with me. Ah. Never underestimate the difference you can make. God uses us in our strengths and our weaknesses. In our strengths and our weaknesses. Here's what he says. Ehud says, the Lord has given your enemy, the Moabites, into your hands. How did he know that? They hadn't fought a battle yet. Oh, because faith sees things as done before they happen. And God raised up a deliverer and Ehud knew it. I believe those words were God breathed. God raised him up and said, you tell my people it's time to be set free because they have humbled themselves before me and because I am their deliverer and I've raised up a deliverer to set them free. Ah, and they have 80 years of undisturbed peace. 80 years. That's a long time. 80 years of peace. Woo! Serenity. Peace. Ah. Verse 31. After Ehud, we presume that he dies. And we also presume that they go back to their old ways. Because he has to raise up another judge. After Ehud, Shamgar, son of Anath, rescued Israel. And he once killed 600 Philistines with an ox goad. How many of you have an ox goad? No one? All right. About eight feet long. Prick on one end. Remember what Jesus told Saul? Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? How long will you kick against the goad? Come on. Move it. Go in this direction, <laughs> whatever. And the other side had a, had a, had a flat, uh, like a spade that they would use to to get dirt and stuff off of a plow. And so this man um, takes this instrument in his hand and he kills is it, 600 Philistines. Okay, you don't do that if God hasn't empowered you. This is not like the Bruce Lee movie where he kills like 300 people in 10 minutes. Well, they all come at him one at a time. 
And this is not what that is. This is a supernatural work. And we'll see it again in Judges where God empowers a man. And what does he take? He takes the, a simple instrument, nothing remarkable about the goat, but, but in the hands of God, he can use an ox goad to bring deliverance to his people. Because God can use and he wants to use whatever's in our hands. Whatever, what's, it, what, what's in your hands? Not what's in your wallet. We'll get to that in the capital campaign. But what's in your hands? I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. What's in your hands? You're like, Lord, I don't have much. But, 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 but you have something, right? Uh, Shamgar was a laborer just doing his job, and he took what was in his hands, prompted by God, and he rescued the people of God from their enemy. And there's one sentence about him in the entire Bible. How awesome is that? That's all we know about him. What a great thing to say. It's thousands of years later, and we're reading about Shamgar. Like Moses with the shepherd's staff, and like David with the shepherd's sling, or like the boy who said, I got five loaves of bread and two fish. You can have that. And Jesus took it, and he multiplied it, and he fed a multitude. A multitude. Thousands. As many as 10,000 people. We don't know for sure. What's in your hands? Don't think that you have to have something huge or big in your hands to serve God. Oh, no, look, I, I have nothing to offer you, God. Think small. Don't think grandiose and huge and, oh, we're going to, oh, hey, no, you know, how about start with what's in your hands? I was like, Lord, how am I going to, how am I going to defeat this Philistine army? What have you got? I got an ox gold. Get busy. Oh, yes, a simple thing, a small thing. We have a tendency in the body of Christ to raise up people and their giftedness to the place of stardom, and it's not good. We begin to worship at the new book or the new thing or the other, and it's like, you know what? I, I get honoring those who labor diligently among you, but sometimes we raise up people so high, and it's like, you know what? That's not safe air up there. That's reserved for Jesus, thank you. And we think we have to have something great. We have to be this. We have to act this way. Well, I can't speak, Lord. God said, no problem. We'll send Aaron with you. He'll be your mouthpiece. Yeah. Think small. Think small. What have you got? What have you got to work with? The smallest thing. Pray and ask God. Lord, take, I don't, I don't even know what I have to offer you, but, but, but whatever I have, I'll give it to you. And before you know it, God will, maybe it's a, a, a prayer. The great equalizer. I don't know. I, I just think, don't, you don't have to think big. Start small and watch what God does. Start with your ox goad. Start with that. See what happens. God uses simple things to accomplish great exploits. Simple things. I wrote this down. God often uses the most unlikely people in the most unconventional ways to accomplish the most amazing feats which only he can do all for his glory. Joshua, you, you said it. You said that when, when this thing kicks off, you know who will get all the glory. It won't be us. It's unconventional. Do you think you're a candidate to be used by the Lord? Oh, I, 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 oh, I, I hope that you do. I hope you're not waiting for some, I don't know, to reach some level of maturity or, oh, you know, not yet. I'm, no, I can't, I can't tell that person about Jesus. No, 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 I can't. You know, man, like I sinned last week. No, you probably sinned last night. But anyway, no, listen, we already know that. You know, I'm not perfect. I love when people say that. Well, you know, pastor, I'm not perfect. You know what I say? I already know that. 
None of us are. You don't have to preface by telling me that. <laughs> well, you know, nobody's perfect, duh. I know, yeah. Ah, anyway, does that hopefully think small, follow his heart, watch what he does. You might not be called to the other part of the, of the planet, but you might be called to your neighbor. Or you might be called to pray for your own family. Think small. What you got? Use it for his glory. Father, thank you for this, this opportunity to share your word and to learn. Now, God, as we enter into this, this phase, Lord, we, we acknowledge that apart from you, we can do nothing. And Lord, that you would be glorified as we speak about what we have to lay before you that you would continue to breathe life into it. In Jesus' name, amen. Everybody stand up, stand up, stand up for a minute. All right. You don't have to. You can still stay seated. Some of you like sitting. I like to stand up every 20 minutes, I know. Someone once said the brain can only absorb what the bottom, never mind, something like that. All right, have a seat. Here we go. We are kicking off our fundraising campaign we're excited. We believe that God has called us to lead people into authentic, growing relationships with Jesus Christ. How do you measure that? Hmm. It's not easy. I have 20 different things I'm trying to measure, and it's all a part of it. Our core values are to be biblically based, to be led by the Holy Spirit, to do life together, to do church as a team. We believe that everyone is a servant leader, and we believe that everyone is an evangelist. Everyone. We believe that. How does this new building situation fit into that? And I said this, I don't know if I said it last service, increased opportunity. And that was something that Ms. Orr is going to share with you in a bit about opportunity. The environment, it's a central place to gather. There are opportunities there to serve the community together, to evangelize the community, which have already started, to welcome those who are guests. The logistics of such, the flexible schedule is so nice. We put things on the wall, we can leave it there. We don't have to ask anyone if it's okay to use the sanctuary. I mean, you walk in the front door and you don't have to be greeted by Shamgar, the, uh, the, the knight. Thank you, whatever. Yeah, I was thinking, what is that thing? Yeah, some, the knight in shining armor, which is great when we do a series on spiritual warfare. Beyond that, it's just a conversation piece. Uh, Kitchen, we'll talk about. Worship team flexibility. Offices and church together. We believe that our church should be the go-to place for counseling in our neighborhood. We believe that our church should be the go-to place for kids. That really matters to us. Ownership versus lease. Don will talk about those numbers in a little bit. We have some pictures here, some artist renditions, and there's some more that you can see as well. Again, why 2400 North Michael Way at Torrey Pines, location, church community, um, houses, surrounded by houses, condominiums across the street, apartments down the street. Ministry to the budget suites, we've not forgotten about that. They've um, not allowed us to come back or anyone to come back because of COVID, but we're going to be kicking that up again. And it'll be so great to have something at the, at the suites. And when they ask, where's your church? Say, we are 0.9 miles that way, not even a mile away from the budget suites. <clears throat> Hope House is literally one block away so if anything ever goes down we can call the 
call them, hey, man, y'all need to get over here. <laughs> we can call Big B and say, hey, Big B, man, the alarm's going off. Go handle it. Call me if you need me. Uh, continue to work, minister through West Care and the schools that are around the neighborhood. We believe that though we, 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 we're, this, we do a little bit of that here, but uh, we believe there's much more opportunity um, in this location. Uh, very briefly, let me tell you where we are now. Um, we've raised $215,700 for the building fund. That includes money that we've used to purchase land. So that's going to come up in a minute. Um, we have 100, 162000 in savings, basically. We have gotten the special use permit that we need to have a church there um, from the city of Las Vegas. Um, the next slide is of the land. That's two and a half acres that we paid $400,000 cash for. And so Living Grace Foursquare Church owns that piece of property. <laughs> Amen. We have, um, we have hired a general contractor and an architect, and my brother Jay is serving alongside that team, and he's, he's, uh, he's a real gift. It's a real gift to have him a part of that team. And um, we're looking forward to going to Hawaii and sp having some meetings over there with him. Zoom is cool. Who said that? Zoom is good, but we need to meet face to face. No, no, no. We'll come to you, bro. We'll come to you. We'll come to you. Friday? Yeah. A week? Okay. Um, Foursquare Financial Services is a lending branch of the Foursquare Church that only lends to Foursquare churches, and they've already approved us for uh, preliminarily approved us for a loan of one point seven seven five million. Um, we have a, a fundraising team that we've established that meets every Friday and is talking about different creative ways, prayerfully uh, considering ways to help raise the funds that we need that will be in addition to the pledges that you guys do. And so if you're on the fundraising committee, would you stand up, please? Thank you, Diane and Miss Aura, <laughs> Sister Box. Yay, there's Mel. Kim, thank you, guys. Sister Box, come on up. Um, Don's going to share a little bit about the... Um, Wipe the mic, I see. I see how it is. I see. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, numbers. I know he mentioned it a little bit, but where uh, exactly we are and what those numbers mean. Did you have a slide for that? There we go. So like he said, we've been pre-approved for a loan for one point seven seven five million. Uh, with our savings and our building fund account, we have another 625000 Amen to all of those who have faithfully been giving. By the way, that, that uh, building fund has been built up by the faithful just giving a little bit, some $20, some 5 some 100 I mean, it's just been every month just for 10 years, and we've built our, our building fund up that way, so don't despise the, the little. But um, so that's where we're at right now. We have 2.4 million available to us to build our project. 400,000 of that went to purchase our land. 15% uh, of the construction costs, which is about 255,000. Our calculations today, like he mentioned, so prices are going up daily. Um, because of that, that number might go up a little bit more. Um, but we have to have a 15% reserve of construction costs. That's about 255000 right now, and we can't touch that. It has to stay in our account. So construction costs are estimated to be 1.7 as of, well, our last estimate. Um, we are waiting for some bids from the steel company, and we've been waiting for weeks, and they've been having trouble getting numbers because their suppliers are having trouble giving them numbers because prices keep going up. So we prayerfully keep this in prayer. We will have a, a final bid within the next week. So um, 
anyway, just a little little side note about that. Um, as soon as we get those that bit in, then the rest can roll a lot quicker. What is not included in that number is interest on the loan. When we start pulling, uh, drawing funds out of that loan, we won't be we won't be getting the whole loan at once. We'll we'll draw funds out of that as needed. But once we start drawing funds, we're going to have to start paying interest. And that is not included in that number. The other thing that's not included in that number is any interior design we want to do. We have the basics included. If you've ever bought a new house, it's like, okay, here's the house. It's only this much. And then you're like, linoleum floors and, you know, plastic. <laughs> We want to do some upgrades, and so none of that is included also in that number. So those are the things that we have to raise money for. Our interior designer, Janae Hightower over here, is saying amen. <laughs> She's praying the hardest <laughs> so she can do all the amazing things that she has planned uh, to do for our church to make it look beautiful and welcoming and fun for the kids as well. So those are the things that we need to raise funds for. Um, You'll be hearing a little more about that. And then with that, our monthly payment then for our new church will be $10,068. Putting that in perspective uh, per month, putting that in perspective, when we had this building by ourselves without the school in it, we were paying between eighteen and 20000 a month. <laughs> right now... Um, now that we're sharing and now that we've been able to get a, a discount um, between this building and then our offices, which you know are down the street, we're paying 6000 a little over 60 I feel my off? 6350 Okay, so that's what we're paying right now a month. So only a couple thousand more, and it'll be our own property. We'll be able to pay it down eventually, own it outright. Um, so... That's something to look forward to. We're excited about that. Amen? Okay, now the building. You've seen these pictures here. Um, these are pictures of, uh, potential, of what the outside will, will look like uh, for the first phase, phase one. And that's going to include, here's a preliminary floor plan. There's been several adjustments to this, but they were holding off to find out uh, what the bids are going to come in at to make sure we can start this project <laughs> before they put in all of our changes, which um, we'll talk about some of those changes as we go. But we'll start with the sanctuary here. Sanctuary. Um, the sanctuary is about, um, it's about 10 feet wider than this one. It's about the same width. It's about 10 feet deeper than this one. And so we'll be able to uh, seat about 275 people right now comfortably. Right now we can squeeze in maybe about 200. So that gives you a little perspective of, of the size that the sanctuary will be. We'll have a nursing mother's room. Yay, and all the mothers said, yay, finally. Um, we'll have a uh, music room here, which will also be the prayer room for after service. Storage. Uh, this has all changed a bit. This will be behind the wall there, so we won't see that out front of the stage. Uh, storage back here. These are the children's ministry rooms. Uh, this has changed also. We'll have a nursery here and then the two rooms here. Um, this is set up for a preschool. Uh, so all the regulations and codes and everything that you have to follow to open up a preschool, we're incorporating into this. So we'll have the restrooms, little kitchen area, storage, laundry, and all that so that we can have a preschool. This right here will be the offices. Uh, the youth will be meeting in here for now until phase two. We'll talk to that in a minute. And then this right here, what we've all been waiting for, is the kitchen. And this right here will be uh, the cafe. We'll have a pantry. It's kind of designed different now. Um, when we get those plans, we'll show them to you when they get those changes made. But uh, there'll be a cafe here. Uh, the cafe will be fully functional in phase one. The kitchen will be phase two, all the equipment and everything we'll have to raise additional funds for, unless 
the Lord wants to bless us and raise above and beyond what we're even asking for, and we can do that all at once. That'd be awesome as well. This right here is phase two. This is the fellowship hall. Uh, this also has changed. Uh, there'll be youth and junior high rooms back here. This will all be fellowship hall. Maybe in the future, if we want to have a, a bookstore or something, that can go up here in the front. Uh, back here will be basketball court area for the youth to hang out. Um, up front will be a courtyard. Um, like I said, this is kind of all re refigured, but there'll be a courtyard here, so you can come out from the cafe, have your little smoothie out there in the little courtyard area. Uh, this, uh, of course, is all the um, uh, foyer. It'll be bigger than the little box we have right now, so you all can hang out. Um, so basically, that's it. We got the pantry in here, too. So do you guys have any questions about the building, about the funds or anything? All right. Well, that's it, and that's what we're looking forward to. Amen. Very cool. <clears throat> uh, come on up, uh, Kim and Ora. We are in need of about $300,000 to finish the project. And um, I'll let them explain the numbers on how that, how that works with, um, with us. Uh, just a, a, a point to mention that the time is of the essence because construction costs are just like whoop, 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 whoop. And um, <clears throat> also, as far as uh, our, someone asked me for a service, so you know, we're, giving, we're giving like a tithe to the church. Should that go to the building campaign? And we're like, well, you know what? Pray about that because we have to maintain our tithes and offerings you know, in the process. And so uh, this is kind of over and above, <clears throat> um, over and above that. And as Don mentioned, uh, the sooner we can raise this the better because as we start construction we're paying interest in um on on the loan that, on the portion that we do use for construction so anyway uh kim and aura are part of our fundraising team and they're also a part of our council uh brother dave's on our council eric he's on our eric uh box i mean fox he's on our, our council uh is anyone else i'm missing part of the council? oh yeah miss nene she's part of the council too who else i'm missing someone else okay yeah Okay, yeah, but anyway, these guys are part of the council, and they're part of the uh, fundraising uh, t uh, committee as well, so they're going to share a little bit more on some of those details. Good morning. Um, all right, so each of you should have a card. If you don't have a card, raise your hand. We'll get you a card. Um, <clears throat> so on here, it's pretty self-explanatory, name, address, city, phone, um, the amount you'd like to pledge per week, per month, a one-time gift, or a different amount um, other. And then you tear off this portion, and you keep for yourself. You fill in what you've pledged to, and you keep for yourself, and put it something somewhere daily that you can see it, so you can continue to pray about what God um, is going to do, because there are miracles coming. Amen? Um, so each person please take a card, even if you're part of the same family. And I would also encourage you to give this card, we have plenty, to your children. As he was speaking, he says, whatever's in your hand, place this in your children's hands because they can be praying. Teenagers can be praying. Little children can be praying because we're all part of the same family. So I would just encourage you to take a card for everybody. Okay, um, and so consider that you would either turn your card in today or by next Sunday, um, and then just when you make your gift, designate it to the building campaign, okay, so that we can um, make sure that it's uh, qualified that way. Um, and like he said, fundraisers are going to be planned so that you can also include other people in your sphere, okay, um, that are able to give like a one-time thing for a fundraiser. Um, so if we have 100 members, 100 givers, this $300 a month, $75 a week, um, above your tithe, then that's our 300000 okay? And a lot of people cannot meet that 
amount. We're all part of the same family. It's okay. That's just the plain math, okay? You add the numbers up, that's the plain math. But as I was praying, I discovered what you may be obvious to you, um, that God has a different economy. God is a giver. He's impartial, and he gives to everyone. He gives peace, provision, protection, salvation, eternal life in Jesus. He gives hope, joy, peace, grace, promises, wisdom, favor, strength, direction, rewards, patience, kindness, endurance, faith, and gifts of many kinds. He takes the intangible and makes it tangible. That's God's economy. So each of us have different circumstances, especially in the light of this past year. We're living in uncharted territories, um, but it's exciting times. We can be filled with that joy. It's exciting to see what God is going to do. And so um, he's equipped each of us with various gifts. So consider what you can give. Some are prayer warriors. Some are encouragers. Some have a generous heart. And some have faith that can move mountains. So with those, just a few gifts, pray that God will open doors. Encourage those that will question if God's really going to answer. From a generous heart, those with a generous heart, give as God leads. And exercise that faith that will move the mountains that stands in the way of God's purposes. So remember, God takes the intangible and makes it tangible. And so by his word in 2 Corinthians 9, 7 through 11, it says, each man should give what he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, but God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound in you so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, he scattered abroad his gifts to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies the seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be made rich in every way so that God will make you generous on every occasion. And through each of us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. And ultimately, that's our goal, that in unity together, we're all part of the family, that we will bring glory to God. So with your gift, just keep that in prayer and um, just put this in the hands of your children too. Amen. Amen. Beautiful. How's everyone doing? Got to stand up. Good, good, good. So uh, during this campaign, I'm your hype woman, okay? Yeah, baby, it's me. And, uh, you know, it was an easy job to take with the gift of encouragement. Uh, it's easy for me to get in front of people and share whatever it is that needs to be shared. Uh, today, we're here because the Lord gave me a word. Uh, I came here thinking on Friday that I was going to really talk to you guys about faith and, and all of that, right? That's another gift I have, the gift of faith. But today, the Lord told me to talk to you about this word, opportunity. Can I get the guys to say opportunity? Okay, come on, ladies. Let's, let's just show them how to do things, okay? Okay? So, but that's okay because, you know, I often think about, like, you know, 
my husband, I tell him what to do, but sometimes I tell other men what to do and it don't work. So maybe that's why they said opportunity. Some of them probably looked at the wise and said, do I say it, honey? But here we go. Here we go. Ladies, say opportunity. opportunity. Amen. That's what it's called, opportunity. So today, what pastor and what the Lord has given us is an opportunity, an opportunity to have a presence in an area where my pastor years ago, when I asked him the definitive question, where do you see us? And trust me, we had looked here, there, and everywhere, and he said, like right there in my way. And I said, well, let's stop looking for anything else. Let's just focus our attention there. The first service didn't hear that, but the Lord just wanted me to remind, uh, remind pastor that he said it. And he made the commitment. And we, we had some opportunities and we missed him. But now here's what the Lord said to me. When he gave me that word opportunity, I said, Lord, help me explain what that means, right? And, and so I went through my little notes. I, I have probably, I have hundreds of sermons on my phone because I read the Bible and when the Lord gives me a word, I build a sermon. And this was the definition with the help of Dr. Charles Stanley. Opportunity is a favorable time when we are in position that will impact me, you, and others in a positive way. That's what opportunity is, and that's what this is. Being that uh, I'm a real estate agent and serving the community since 1981, I'm very number-oriented because we're taught to set goals at the beginning of the year and how many homes we need to sell, and we divide the commission, and, and we end up with this number of production. And so a few months back, we asked, how many families do we have here? And you guys heard uh, it's about 108 giving families that give regularly. So when we were told that what we need to look for right now, what, we're, what our goal is, is 300,000. In my mind, I said, okay, 300,000 divided by 100 families equals $3,000 in 10 months, right? And so that, that just was easier. But, but when we had a meeting last Thursday, I, I thought to myself, and I said it to uh, the council, which we have a wonderful council. This is what I said last service about our council. We're like a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. We really taste good when we all get together. And then I reminded them, because the Lord had reminded me the way my grandmother taught me how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich is you put the peanut butter and the jelly in a bowl and you mix it up. And then you spread it on the bread because every bite tastes the same. And that's how we function as a council. And I'm proud to say that. Thank you very much for approving each and every one on the council. So now let's go back to the meeting. We're having a meeting, and we're saying 300,000. And I said, oh, I believe one person could come up with 300,000, right? Because that's the greater faith. I believe right now there is someone who could actually do that. And Lord might be talking to you now, or two people can do 150, and, and we go from there. But my friend Dave, being the wonderful person he is, said, wait, hold up a minute, Aura. Hold up, hold up. If one person gave 300000 then I couldn't get in on the blessing, right? And so I, I kind of jokingly said, well, that's all right, Dave. If they give you three, if they give us 300, you can get on the next one, okay? Because my whole thing is to believe God for the 300000 and where it would be greater faith to believe there's one person who can give 300,000. It just takes a little faith to believe that there's a 100 families here who could give $3,000. And so I want to encourage each and every one of you that, as my sister said, there's no such thing as anything that's too small. I want to encourage you that this, what we're trying to do is, is, is it's kind of like when we're preaching the gospel. We need to tell people the good news of what God has given us an opportunity to do. And I would like to thank you and in advance for all of you who've already made a decision. Just, just right now, so many of you have already made a decision of what you're going to give. And in that giving, there comes a giving that comes back to you that God doesn't even give it to you the way that you give it to him. He presses it down, right? Because he's the God of multiplication. We look forward to having the goals met by next Sunday. 
Um, that's not putting any pressure on anyone, right? Because if everyone prays for that one person, right, <laughs> then that means we could be on phase two because of what you're going to do. I thank you, and I thank you uh, for being part of my church family. I thank you for being an obedient servant to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'll take that microphone. Amen. We stand up. Would you all stand, please? Um, thank you so much for w your extended stay today. It was important that we, we do both. Um, um, we trust in God. Our eyes are on Him. And we'll, we'll, we'll watch what he, do, what he does. We want to share testimonies. Um, I've, I've got some friends that I've known for many, many years. And I, I intend to give these to them as well and say, hey, check it out. Here, here, yeah, here you go. And here's the detail. If anybody wants to know more, they can check out our website. If anybody that's not a part of our church wants to give, they can give on our website. And so, um, yeah, you know what? Um, uh, thank you guys again. And um, we, we, uh, we're, we're grateful to partner together in, in the things of God. Um, and um, so, Father, thank you for today. It's been a great time. We love you. We ask, oh, Lord, that you would be um, the center that you'd be glorified, that you would be, um, uh, your, your word says that unless the Lord build the house, those who labor, labor in vain. And so God, build the house according to your purposes and your plans. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Just really quick, um, the top part of that pledge card you can stick in the tithe box um, right there on your way out. Like you said, drop it by the church or bring it next Sunday, but stick it in the tithe box. The other thing I forgot to mention, I apologize, um, was the importance of those tithe, of those pledge cards. Um, the pledge cards